It's not at all a peaceful morning. The crops have walked out of the field. There they go again. Down with the farmer. We need manure. We need water. No food till we get what we need. Looks like no one has been taking care of the crops. They haven't been getting enough nutrition. The fields have also not been watered well. This way, the fields will soon go dry and the crops will perish. In this lesson, you will know about the need for crop resources and the different farming practices to improve crop production. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to Explain the need for crop resources Describe the methods in selecting a high yield crop variety Describe the factors involved in enhancing crop production and describe the ways in protecting the crop for enhancing crop production. Hi, I am in charge of guarding the crops. But these days, the birds have gotten wiser and they are not scared of me. I must think of other ways to protect the crops. The farmer says that food demands are increasing every day. And we need to work harder to improve yields. I can't think of any reason for this increase in demand. Can you? The population of India is more than 1 billion and is increasing. Therefore, there is an increasing need to feed this growing population. Recent efforts to increase food production have proved successful. The Green Revolution contributed to increased food grain production and the White Revolution contributed to increased availability of milk. Living organisms need food. Food provides nutrients like carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals for growth and health. Cereals provide carbohydrate. Pulses provide protein. Oil seeds provide fats and vegetables, spices and fruits provide vitamins and minerals. In addition to these, fodder crops provide food for livestock. We obtain most of our food from agriculture. Different crops require different climatic conditions to grow. Karif crops are grown in the rainy season, which is from June to October. This season is called the Karif season. Paddy, soya bean, maize, cotton, green gram and black gram are Karif crops. Rabi crops are grown in the winter season from November to April. This season is called Rabi season. Wheat, gram, peas and linseed are Rabi crops. In India, the production of food grains increased four times from 1960 to the year 2000. This increase in food production is due to crop variety improvement, crop production improvement, and 
Crop Protection Management I am glad that crops are really being looked after. But how do we arrive at a high yield crop variety? We find the high yield crop by a process of selection. The criteria for the selection could be high yield, disease resistance, response to fertilizer, tolerance to climate, etc. Desirable traits are incorporated into the plant by the process of hybridization. In this process, genetically dissimilar plants are crossed. It is one of the methods for crop variety improvement. Hybridization happens by cross-breeding genetically different plants. This crossing may be between two different varieties known as intervarietal crossing, between two different genera known as intergeneric crossing, or between two different species known as interspecific crossing. Another way of improving crop yield is by introducing the desirable genes into the crop plant. This results in genetically modified crop plants that are able to survive in a drought and waterlogged conditions. Now I get it. Since crop yield is related to weather, soil quality and availability of water, crop varieties that can grow in different conditions are developed. Now let us look at the reasons why crop variety improvement is done. The primary reason is to increase the yield of the crop. A second reason is to improve the quality of the crop products. For example, to improve the protein content in pulses oil content in oil seeds and preserving quality in fruits and vegetables. A third reason is to develop crops resistant to biotic factors like bacteria and insects and abiotic factors like drought, salinity, water logging, heat and cold conditions. A fourth reason is to develop crops with a shorter duration from sowing to harvesting as it is economical. A fifth reason is to develop plants with a greater adaptability to climatic conditions so that multiple rounds of crops can be grown in a year. The sixth and final reason I will give you is to introduce desirable characteristics. For example, tallness and profuse branching are desirable for fodder crops, while a shorter height is desired for cereals. Fewer nutrients are consumed by these crops and they give higher yield. Wow! That's incredible! The farmer will be thrilled to know that so much could be done to improve the yield. Crop production improvement is the protection of crops that are growing or have been harvested. It is the farmer's purchasing capacity that decides the cropping system and production practices. Nutrient management irrigation and cropping patterns can help to improve crop production. Okay, now I understand why the farmer keeps saying that plants need nutrients for growth just like we need food for our growth. Well, it's different that I don't get much of a chance to grow. 
There are 16 nutrients that are essential for plants. Nutrients are supplied to plants by air, water and soil. Air supplies carbon and oxygen. Water supplies hydrogen and oxygen. Soil supplies the rest of the 13 nutrients to the plants. Among these 13 nutrients, 6 nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium and sulfur are required in large quantities. These are called macronutrients. The other seven nutrients, such as iron, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and chlorine, are used by plants in smaller quantities. These are called micronutrients. I get it. That means a deficiency of these nutrients makes the plants prone to diseases. So, to improve crop production, the soil must be enriched with these nutrients. But how is this done? This is done with manure. Manure is produced naturally by the decomposition of animal excreta and plant waste. Manure contains organic matter and thus increases soil fertility. It also improves the water holding capacity in sandy soils and prevents water logging in clay soils. Based on the kind of biological waste, Manure is classified as compost, vermicompost, and green manure. Let's focus on compost first. Compost is prepared by decomposing farm waste like livestock excreta, vegetable waste, domestic and sewage waste in pits. This process is called composting. Compost is also prepared by using earthworms to fasten the decomposition of plant and animal wastes. This is called vermicompost. Before sowing crop seeds, plants like sunhemp are grown and ploughed into the soil. These green plants enrich the soil with nitrogen and phosphorus. This is called green manure. Apart from natural manure, fertilizers are also used to improve crop production. Fertilizers supply nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to the plants. But I have seen that the continuous use of fertilizers kills useful microorganisms and even destroys soil fertility. What about that? That is why the chemical fertilizers are being replaced with biofertilizers. These are some biological agents used in organic farming. Blue-green algae are used to prepare biofertilizer. And neem leaves or turmeric are used in grain storage as biopesticides. Uses of biofertilizers are emphasized to maintain soil fertility. Wow! That was eye-opening information on natural and chemical nutrients. 
I must ask the farmer to use more biofertilizers from now on. Wonder what else can be done to improve production. Success of crops in most areas is dependent on timely monsoons and sufficient rainfall. To ensure that crops get water at the right stages of their growing season, more agricultural land needs to be brought under irrigation. What is irrigation? Irrigation is the artificial supply of water to the soil by different means such as wells, canals, rivers and tanks. Let's take a closer look at the different methods of irrigation. Fields with no source of river water are irrigated with water from the wells. Wells are of two types namely dug wells and tube wells. In a dug well, water is collected from the water bearing strata. Tube wells can tap water from the deeper strata. Water is lifted from tube wells by pumps. Canals receive water from reservoirs or rivers. The main canal is divided into branched canals to irrigate the fields. In areas where the canal flow is insufficient due to inadequate reservoir release, another method known as river lift systems is used. In this method, water is directly drawn from the rivers. Here are some tanks. Tanks are small reservoirs which store runoff water. Recent attempts to increase the availability of water involve rainwater harvesting. Rainwater is harvested in check dams which increase the groundwater levels and reduce soil erosion. Hey. Take a look at this farm. There are two types of crops growing at the same time. That's very smart, isn't it? Different ways of growing crops can be followed to give maximum benefit. Cropping patterns used for greater yield are mixed cropping, intercropping and crop rotation. Mixed cropping is growing two or more crops simultaneously on the same piece of land. Examples include wheat and gram or groundnut and sunflower. This gives some insurance against the failure of one of the crops. Intercropping is growing two or more crops simultaneously on the same field with a few rows of one crop alternating with a few rows of a second crop. Examples include soya bean and maize or finger millet and cowpea. The crops are selected such that their nutrient requirements are different. This ensures maximum utilization of the nutrients and also prevents pests and diseases of one crop spreading to the other crop in a field. Growing different crops in succession on a piece of land is known as crop rotation. The choice of crops depends on the availability of moisture and irrigation. With good crop rotation, Two or three crops can be easily grown in a year. Examples include cereals alternating with legumes, soya bean alternating with maize. Look at these weeds. It seems like the farmer has become quite lazy these days. He needs to be told 
that weeds are dangerous for crops. Nurturing crop plants against the damages caused by weeds, pests, and diseases is known as crop protection management. Weeds like xanthium, parthenium, and Cyperinus rotundus are unwanted plants in the crop field. They compete with the crop plants for food, space, and light, and finally reduce crop growth. Weeds can be removed by spraying herbicides or by mechanically removing them. Timely sowing of crops, intercropping, and crop rotation effectively control weeds. The use of resistant varieties and summer plowing also destroys weeds. Oh no! What are these? Somebody help me! Please! These insects are called pests. They damage the crops. Generally, pests attack plants and reduce their yield. They cut the root, stem, and leaves, suck the cell sap, and bore into the stem and fruits. Pests can be controlled by using pesticides. Diseases in plants are caused by pathogens such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses, just like in humans. These pathogens are transmitted through soil, water, and air. They can be controlled by spraying insecticides and fungicides on crop plants. Where have all the crops gone? The crops have been harvested and the grains have been stored. But crops need protection during storage as well. Storage losses in crops are due to biotic factors like insects, rodents, fungi, mites, and bacteria. Abiotic factors like inappropriate moisture and temperatures in the storage place also damage crops. These factors lead to loss in weight and discoloration of the grains, which leads to poor marketability. Grains should be cleaned and properly dried, first in the sunlight and then in shade, before storage. Exposure to chemical fumes helps to kill pests. This process is called fumigation. If we follow all these steps, we will definitely reduce storage losses. The increase in the human population has led to a rise in the demand for meat. Livestock production needs to gear up to meet this increased demand for hygienically produced meat, eggs, and other animal produce such as honey. So how do we ensure these needs are met? That's where animal husbandry comes in. In this lesson, you will learn about animal husbandry. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to Define animal husbandry Describe cattle farming Explain the management practices for rearing cattle Describe poultry farming Explain the significance of crossbreeding
Explain the management practices for poultry farming. Describe fish farming. Identify the various ways of obtaining fish. Classify the species of fish that are farmed. Explain marine fishery. Explain inland fishery. Describe composite fish farming. Describe beekeeping and list various varieties of bees. Animal husbandry is the farming and management of animal livestock, including cattle, goat, sheep, poultry, and fish. It includes various aspects, such as feeding, breeding, and disease control. Meet Moo. Looks like she's going somewhere. She looks excited. Hey, I hear from my friends that life on their farm is very comfortable. My village in the mountains is riddled with diseases, and we're running short of food. I'm tired of the daily struggle, so I'm on my way to join my friends. Hey, there's the farm. Looks like a nice, clean place. And I can smell the hay. I'm hungry already. Now let me see. They have cattle, poultry, fish, and even bees here. I should be able to find my friends in the cattle farm, so I'll head there. See you. Looks like Moo has found her friends. And a lot of new people as well. As you can see, along with cows, cattle include buffaloes, goats, and sheep. The practice of rearing cattle by providing facilities for raising livestock is called cattle farming. Two major species of Indian cattle are Bos indicus, or cows, and Bos bubalis or buffaloes. Cattle farming is done for milk production and agricultural work. Milk producing female animals are called dairy animals. Therefore, Moo is a dairy animal and she will probably contribute to the milk production at the farm in due course. Agricultural work involves tilling, irrigation, and carting. Male cattle used for such farm labor are called draft animals. Moo's friend, Big Joe, is involved in agricultural work. Hey, you look great. I'm so excited. Why don't you show me around? Where do you live? What kind of food do they give you? Let's take a tour of the farm with Moo. This will be a good opportunity to examine the management practices for rearing cattle. Should be interesting to find out how they are able to keep their cattle well fed and happy. Ah. These cattle seem to be enjoying themselves. Look at how well they're being groomed. Moo is already enjoying her first cleaning session. As you can see, cleaning involves regular brushing and washing to remove dirt and loose hair. Now let's follow her to see where their living quarters are. There they go. Nice shelter, isn't it? Shelter facilities include well ventilated roof sheds to protect cattle from rain, heat, and cold. Let's leave them to rest for a while. This seems to be where the cattle eat. Animal feed are of two types feed containing high fiber content, called roughage 
for energy and concentrate feed that is feed containing low fiber and high protein content for increasing body weight my friend milly was really in bad shape when i left the farm something called foot and mouth disease i hope the disease hasn't reached here mood doesn't need to worry Diseases in cattle are caused by external and internal parasites. External parasites live on the skin and cause skin diseases. Internal parasites like worms affect the stomach and intestine. Liver fluke, an internal parasite, often damages the liver of cattle. Infectious diseases are often caused by bacteria and viruses. So how does this farm handle these threats? This farm has set up a proper disease control system. Shelters and other areas on the farm are cleaned and disinfected regularly. And vaccination against various diseases is provided to all cattle. Can you guess what this is? The milk production unit of course. As a dairy animal, Moo is likely to spend a lot of time here if she gives birth to a calf. The period following the birth of a calf is called the lactation period because during this period high milk production is observed by lengthening the lactation period through hormonal stimulation milk production can be enhanced wow i see some foreigners here as well that's a jersey cow and this one is the brown swiss that's interesting wonder what they are doing on this farm can you guess why Foreign and local breeds can be crossbred to facilitate the growth of animals with desired qualities. For example, a Jersey cow has a long lactation period. On the other hand, a local breed like a Red Sindhi cow displays a high resistance to diseases. Therefore, Cross breeding among the Jersey and Red Sindhi breeds might lead to a new breed with a long lactation period as well as a strong resistance to diseases. Hey, who lives in that area across the field? I see some hens. Moo is talking about the poultry farming section. Poultry farming is the practice of raising poultry for egg production and chicken meat. Typically, fowls and improved poultry breed are used for producing eggs and broilers are used for producing meat. Remember we spoke about crossbreeding in cattle farming? Crossbreeding is common in poultry as well. For example, an Indian breed, a seal, is often crossbred with a foreign breed, leghorn, to develop new varieties with desirable traits. So what could such desirable traits be? To give you an idea, crossbreeding is done to develop dwarf broiler parents for commercial chick production. which ensures that the birds are ready to be used as meat within a very short period of time reduce the size of the fowls which are egg laying smaller birds consume less food and yield the same number of eggs as larger birds increase the number and quality of chicks lower maintenance requirements and 
enables the poultry to tolerate high temperatures during summer. Let's look at the management practices for poultry farming. Maintenance of temperature, which is optimum for the survival of poultry. Provision of hygienic housing conditions. Provision of a protein-rich diet with high levels of vitamin A and K. And the prevention and control of pests and diseases through proper sanitation, spraying of disinfectants, and vaccination. Sounds impressive. And what's that? Ah, the fish production unit. Yes, those enclosures that look like tanks are used to produce fish for commercial purposes. This is also called fish farming or aquaculture. Fish is a cheap source of animal protein. Generally, Fish production involves two main species of fish. Finned true fish such as cutla and rohu and shellfish such as prawns and mollusks. We obtain fish in two ways. Capture fishing and culture fishing. Capture fishing involves obtaining fish from natural resources like seawater or freshwater, such as rivers and ponds. Culture fishing involves culturing the fish in small enclosures. Fishing is classified into two types depending upon the resources used for fishing marine fishery and inland fishery. Fishing in salt water regions like seas and oceans is called marine fisheries. Marine fishing resources include 7,500 kilometers of the Indian coastline. Marine fish are caught using fishing nets. Popular marine fish varieties include pomfret, mackerel, and tuna. Marine fish of high economic value are farmed in seawater like bhekki and pearl spots. Shellfish such as prawns, mussels and oysters are also farmed in seawater. Oysters are cultivated for the pearls they make. But I have heard that the stock of fish in the oceans is getting depleted. Unfortunately, that's true. But as the marine fish stock gets depleted, the demand for more fish can be met by culture fishing or mariculture. Mariculture involves culturing of fish in marine water. Another technique for capturing fish is by locating large schools of fish in the open sea using satellites and eco-sounders. Inland fisheries comprise freshwater regions like freshwater canals, ponds, rivers and reservoirs where fish are trapped or captured. Another rich source of fish are found in reservoirs where freshwater and seawater mix together. These regions are called estuaries. Interestingly, fish culture is sometimes combined with rice farming so that fish can be grown in the paddy fields. I wonder what kind of food they eat. Do all of them have similar feeding habits like us cows? Feeding habits of fish can differ significantly. This makes it possible to do intensive fish farming of five or six fish species with different food habits in a single fish pond. This kind of fish farming is called composite fish farming. 
For example, consider the following combination. Katla, the surface feeders. Rohu, that feed in the middle zone of the pond. Mrigal and common carp, that are bottom feeders and grass carp that feed on weeds. So, all of these species can coexist in a single pond without fighting with each other for food. This helps increase the yield of fish from the pond. However, one problem with such composite fish culture is that many of these fish breed only during the monsoons. Even if fish seed is collected from the natural habitat of a particular fish, it may be mixed with the eggs of other species of fish. So, a major problem in fish farming is the lack of availability of good quality seed or eggs. To overcome this problem, fish is bred in ponds by hormonal stimulation. Fish are injected with hormones that stimulate the production of eggs or seed. This ensures the supply of pure fish seed of desired quantities. Hey, stay away from those boxes, Moo. Why? What's in these boxes? They contain beehives. Beehives are enclosed structures in which honey bees live and raise their young. The practice of maintaining honey bee colonies in beehives is called beekeeping or apiculture. For commercial honey production, bee farms or apiaries are established. Beekeeping helps us obtain honey, which is widely used in food as well as in medicines. Beehives are also a source of wax, which is used in various medicinal preparations, such as ointments, because of its antiseptic properties. Since beekeeping needs low investment, it has become a popular agricultural enterprise. The taste and quality of honey depends upon the pasturage, that is, the flowers available to the bees for nectar and pollen collection. The local varieties of bees used for commercial honey production are Apicerana indica, commonly known as the Indian bee, Apis dorsata, the rock bee, and Apis florae, the little bee. An Italian bee variety Apis mellifera is commonly used for commercial honey production as bees of this species have a high honey collection capacity. This is such a nice place. I am going to try my best to provide good services so I get a place here. This brings us to the end of this lesson on animal husbandry. In this lesson, you have learned about the various aspects of animal husbandry.